Oh, hello, hello, everyone, and thank you so much um, and for joining us and welcome to GBH Ask the Expert. Today, we're going to be learning about storytelling with expert Cheryl Hamilton, and I, of course, am Teresa, GBH host, storyteller, and storytelling enthusiast. Um, we're so grateful to have all of you joining us today, um, and I want to extend a special thanks to our Leadership Circle and RLS members. We appreciate and um, are deeply grateful for your continued and generous support. Now, before we get started, I'd like to introduce um, some of the team behind this event. They're going to be pulling the strings and connecting with you, but you're, generally speaking, not going to see or hear from them. So first, here is my colleague, Bailey, our event producer. Thanks, Teresa. Welcome, everyone. So glad to have you here. Unlike us, you will not be able to hear or see you. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we hope you enjoy our storytelling event. Now it's back to you, Teresa. Thanks, Bailey. Next, I'd like to introduce Jen, who's going to be keeping an eye on the Q&A tab. Jen? Hi, everyone. We definitely want to hear from you throughout today's event, so please insert your questions at the Q&A tab located on the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you see a question already submitted that you also want to hear the answer to, please vote for it by giving it a thumbs up. We'll try to get to as many questions today as we possibly can. Back to you, Teresa. Awesome, thank you, Jen. Um, so I also wanna let everybody know that today we are testing out a brand new Zoom feature, which is closed captioning. We're very excited about this feature. So to access it, you're gonna to go to the bottom of your Zoom screen um, and look for the button that says live transcript. It's a button that has, uh, it looks like a little box with the letters CC in it for closed captioning. When you do this, two transcription options are going to display in a pop-up window on your screen. We recommend that you select subtitle, which will enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. But if you'd like, you also have the option to select full transcript, which is going to open up a sidebar on your screen where you can see what everybody is saying. Please bear in mind, of course, that the closed captioning may be slightly delayed. All right, enough with the background and announcements. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Cheryl Hamilton. So Cheryl has devoted her career to fostering more inclusive communities and encouraging, um, introducing others to the art of storytelling. She currently serves as the director of Suitcase Stories at the International Institute of New England, where she created and directs this popular series, which honors the stories of refugees and immigrant life. She's also the co-founder of Tell and Act, where she works with people to harness the power of storytelling to transform their businesses, communities, and personal lives. And her stories have been featured nationally on The Moth, Risk, and the Sound Bites podcast. She also serves as a coach and curator for Stories from the Stage, a national storytelling program on World Channel, which is produced in collaboration with Tell and Act and GBH, which of course is the show that I host with my co-host Wes Hazard. Please join me with a virtual warm welcome to my good friend and our expert, Cheryl Hamilton. Thanks, Teresa. I guess I feel like they get two for one today because you and I connected through storytelling and I learned so much from you. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm really excited to be here with you. I mean, we're friends and we're also colleagues and um, I'm just excited to be chatting with you this afternoon. Thanks. Me so, too. Cheryl, tell me a little bit about just how you got started. How did you get into storytelling? It was actually kind of an accident. So um, my background is I have a degree in international relations. I've been working on the front lines of refugees and immigrants for 20 years now. But in 2008, I believe it was, um, I was living in Baltimore and I was at a play and it said on the back of the program, do you have a story to tell? And it was for a storytelling one person show class. Mm -hmm. And my best friend like hit me in the ribs. He's like, you have to do this. And I was like, what? That's crazy. I'm not a storyteller. But what he was referencing is that um, my life was changed when 5,000 Somali immigrants moved into Lewiston, Maine, where I'm from. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of stories from that time. And I had a desire to say my piece for lack of a both like piece of like mind and also just a piece of story so i signed up for the class you had to do 20 minutes of a full-length play and when the class was over the director came up to me and said you need to finish that play and i laughed at him and i was like i'm not a storyteller and he goes you are you tell stories 
And so he then graciously volunteered to devote two nights of his life for the next six months. So we'd finish that play. And I ended wow. up opening up in New York City on a one woman show and traveled for five years with it. And again, crazy. <laughs> um, but uh, then I moved to Boston and I retired the show and I missed the scene. I missed storytellers. Mm -hmm. It's a way to build community. So I walked into Club Cassim like so many people in Harvard mm -hmm. Square. That's where I met you. And uh, mm -hmm. I fell in love with storytelling and I started volunteering. I started telling. Eventually, I was the director of Mass Mouth for five years, um, taking over the reins from Nora Dooley. And um, unfortunately, we did, Mass Mouth did close under COVID, um, but I'm still involved in storytelling. And um, I think it's crazy and wonderful and such a privilege. It is such a privilege. And also, Cheryl, you're such a cool lady that you just like casually drop like, oh yeah, I did this one woman <laughs> show, like no big deal. I love it. No, um, I want to remind folks who are joining us today to please use the q and I'm going to be pulling your questions from that um, in just a moment. Um, before we jump into the Q&A, Cheryl, I just want for you to tell all of us a little bit about, you mentioned Mass Mouth, which was a nonprofit in Boston that you headed for several years um, after Nora Dooley. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about Tell and Act and Suitcase Stories and just all of the programs that you're involved in? Sure. So uh, let's start with Tell and Act um, because, again, when Mass Mouth closed, which was an incredible privilege to be part of, um, this is actually how we connected to WGBH. So I believe Jen, who you all just met, reached out, I think it's seven, maybe eight years ago now. I was doing some quick math and asked us if we wanted to do some live storytelling at GBH. And we did, and we had a blast doing it. And then I'll never forget the phone call from the folks at World Channel saying, does Mass Mouth want to turn that storytelling show into a television show nationally? <laughs> I, I also remember hanging up the phone and kind of being like screaming, because <laughs> of course you say yes to that, even if you're a scrappy little nonprofit. Um, but one of the conditions, or I don't know if it was a condition so much as one of the things we really emphasized when we met with World Channel and the amazing folks there was that Mass Mouth is about inviting new voices as well mm -hmm. as experienced voices. And that was going to be something that was really important to us. And it's something mm -hmm. we've committed to since. So if someone's watching and wants to be on stories on the stage, do not get intimidated. Um, we are a supportive group of people. Some of the best stories, I believe eight of the 10 most viewed stories in our first season were first time tellers. Yeah. Um, there's something beautiful and authentic about first time tellers. Um, so then uh, when we did retire, I was um, honored that GBH said, can you continue? My co-founder and director is Anna Willis Collier, who has also performed on the show. She's been coaching people like I have and you have for mm -hmm. years who perform. And we just said, let's, let's do this, let's continue. So we were entering our fourth season. We've had over 200 people tell stories and it's just amazing. Um, meanwhile, Tell and Act, as you described, um, as I learned from my experience with um, storytelling, it's you can tell a great story, but what's even more exciting is we take that great story and do something great with it. Whether mm -hmm. that's nailing a job interview or working on some cause that's really important to you or helping your staff become ambassadors. And that's where Suitcase comes in. So after the election in 2016, as you can imagine, the International Institute of New England serves immigrants and refugees who are dealing with a lot of negative rhetoric. And I went to my boss on a whim and I said, I got this crazy idea. We need to raise funds. But more importantly, in the same way I got joy and a little comfort from doing my story about Maine, I wanted to provide some of that for immigrants in this area. So we had a couple of shows called Suitcase Stories where US and foreign born people get up and tell stories about migration. Mm -hmm. And now that is almost a full-time activity for me in addition to Tell and Act. And it's four years later, we've had again there over 200 people from 80 countries. So. I'm storytelling all the time and I love it <laughs> and I have learned some things I think um, but I'm still learning so this is a good conversation today. Yeah awesome I mean it's so many amazing things that you've been involved in and just sort of have like moved forward I mean you're just you're you're a community connector for for sure and Boston is very lucky to have you New England is lucky to have you. Um, so the top question right now in the Q&A is what techniques do you use to memorize your story and present it so that it's fresh every time? Awesome. Um, I'll be interested in your answer to conversation because in the world of storytelling, there's kind of two camps of people and how they start and then neither, neither one is better. Some mm -hmm. people have to write the whole thing out. They got to get it out of their brain on a page. Um, and some people are able to do that in a way that sounds spoken. Um, now, if someone like me, I don't do that because when I write, we do not all write like we talk. I can get very flourishy. I can say things like my mom declared from the kitchen. 
My mom <laughs> yells from the kitchen in a storytelling show, right? Um, and so what I just do is transitions. I put where is my story going and what do I want to land on at the end in terms of my message? And um, you may be surprised, I never wrote any of those words down in the 90 minute play I did. Um, in fact, the strangest day was when the, when the opening festival in New York wrote me and they said, don't you have a script? And I thought, no. And so my director <laughs> said, well, go, go record yourself on a recording and type it up and send it to them. I'm just a better storyteller when I just speak. Um, so yeah. there's no right way. Um, but for me, because I don't write it down, I feel fresher each time because mm -hmm. I'm just saying in my head the transitions. But there are some amazing storytellers. Uh, Teresa, I'm actually curious. Do you write your stories down or do oh, you? Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> definitely. I mean, the first. How do you keep it fresh? <laughs> the first the first story that I ever told on, on a stage was at um, Doyle's in JP. And then the second time. No, my first time was at Passim. The first slam I went to was at Doyle's. The first time I told was at Passim. And it never occurred to me that it was an option to not write it down first. I just like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And so I need to write it first. Um, so I wrote it down. And I think the way, the way that I keep it fresh is that it's written, but what is on the page is not necessarily what I'm going to say out loud. It's like what is on the page is there to remind me of what needs to be included or what I intend to have included. Um, but I try to tell it. It's easiest with an audience. It's definitely harder over Zoom, but I oh, try yeah. to tell it like I'm talking to the people in the room, you know. Yeah, sure. um, and luckily for me, my voice on paper and my voice in real life are pretty similar. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, but it's, it's a big thing. I think I definitely have stories that I've told so many times that they do start to feel not fresh for me. Mm -hmm. um, and the most helpful thing for me in keeping a story fresh is when the audience tells me what the story meant to them. You know, like there are stories that I've told so many times that it's like, I don't even know what the meaning is anymore, but invariably after, after a performance, someone will tell me like that really impacted me. And when you said this thing, like it really stood out to me and that's what helps keep it fresh is like for me to remember, this may be my 10th time saying this sequence of words, but it's this person's first time hearing it. Yeah, and like with my 90 minute play, actually that one I had to, I had to skip to the, stick to the script in my head, even though it had <laughs> never been written. And the way I did it was just put myself take a breath, put myself in that scene, standing with hundreds of Somali refugees for the first time or going to Africa for the first time and just remembering how my body felt, what I was thinking. And so then try to convey that with my words. But yeah, awesome. absolutely. Next question. So the next question <laughs> is related to that in some ways. It's kind of a question about tools. So the question from Scott is what apps, devices or practices do you work with or use to help better organize your thoughts and storytelling? Those are so fun. Um, I know. I so did not expect this question. <laughs> I wonder what my neighbors think because I practice my stories in my car in mm -hmm. the parking lot because I, I live in a loft with my husband, so I don't want him to hear them when I'm working on them. <laughs> but also there's just something about being alone in that space. So that's where I practice. In terms of apps, you do have to unfortunately become friends with your voice memo on your smartphone. Mm -hmm. You just do. Um, and particularly if you're doing stories from the stage because, and most storytelling shows, they don't want you to send a script. They need to hear you tell. So they're gonna ask you to record it. Now, nobody likes how they sound on a recorder, nobody. Um, but if it makes you feel better, I always remind myself that scientifically it's proven that we do not hear ourselves like we sound. So mm. I like to think I sound amazing, even if as I'm listening to it, I'm like, dear God. <laughs> but the other thing is you need to tell other people your stories. Um, they're so close to us that we don't always know what people need to know or need to hear or understand. And so those are the two things, but perhaps others have apps. I, I'm less familiar with the app world. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely, I mean, voice memo is a big one, you know, like recording yourself, listening to it back. Um, I also am a, am a person who rehearses in the car. I also rehearse <laughs> in the shower as well. I think it's like contained space. It's yeah, a yeah. contained space that helps. <laughs> um, and like acoustics. I don't know. I don't, yeah, I don't know anything about sure. that kind of stuff. But um, I also use an app on my phone called um like voice reader or something like that and it's basically it's it's sort of actually a closed captioning kind of kind of like app um 
So if you can send a Word document or a Google Doc or a PDF to this app, and then the phone will read it out loud to you. Um, and it reads in this like computer voice. And it's super helpful for me to determine if the story is interesting because it's uh. being read in a computer voice. Um, and that way I'm like, I'm not making it interesting with my voice that it's actually interesting because I'm engaged just by this like automated robot reading to me. That's so cool. Thanks. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tips and tricks. All right. So we have Terry who's wondering who first says hello from Cape Cod. Hello, Terry. Um, and is wondering if you have any advice for brand new or aspiring storytellers to gain um, free or inexpensive help to get started and published. Um, he's working with Hay House, um, but that's not super helpful individually for him. And there's also a membership fee. Um, so he's wondering about resources, kind of low cost resources. Yeah, I can say a couple of things. Um, I mean, if you've got some people with an amazing story and they want to pitch for stories from the stage, uh, we give free coaching in advance. So that's a quick way to get right into it and throw yourself yeah. in the deep end. Um, this would not be free to the participant, but certainly in places like Telenact, um, we do offer storytelling. And so oftentimes companies bring us in or partners mm -hmm. in a community and we're pretty low cost, particularly when it works with nonprofits. We want to make this accessible. So then your participants wouldn't pay, but perhaps there'd be a fee arranged there. Mm -hmm. Also right now, um, one of the silver linings, if there is one of COVID is um, the storytelling world has exploded online and so have yeah. sort of workshops and other opportunities. Um, people love that they can perform in San Francisco now because yeah. San Francisco has a show. Um, so there's great Facebook groups, for example, called like virtual events or Northeast storytelling or storytellers. I mean, pretty much for storytelling, you got 12 groups. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that some of them are doing some free stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, mass model, I'm sorry, oh, <laughs> I have so many former roles, Telenac, <laughs> uh, starting in February, does have an intro class the first three Mondays of the nice. month that leads with the showcase at Har Passim. So, awesome. just a couple awesome. few ideas. Yeah, I'd also say, like, when you go to shows, um, when you go to shows on Zoom, a lot of times there's a Q&A at the yeah. end, um, and that's kind of where you can't get individualized coaching, but you can, like, you know, Q and A's are essentially a coaching session. You're hearing, you're hearing it directly from the artist kind of talking about the craft. So that's actually yeah. a good point. Cause on Monday night, um, this coming Monday, um, mm -hmm. Love Pass Seam is one of our partners, much like it was with Mass Mouth. We have mm -hmm. a show called The Producers. And uh, yes, I've been to that show. Yeah, <laughs> we are. So there's uh, four of us that uh, perform from different storytelling organizations cause different storytelling groups have different styles. They're looking mm -hmm. for different types of stories. So this week you'll um, hear four different groups. We tell each tell a story because as producers, we're usually behind the scenes. We miss yes. telling, but then ours also has a Q and A of like, what have we learned um, yeah. in storytelling? So Yeah, and I think so much can be learned from those after show Q and A's. And that almost never happens outside of the Zoom, Zoom world, you yeah, know? So totally. yeah, it's a great resource. All right, so we have Francis with a question of, I love this question. How do you gauge how much emotion or emotional content will grab the audience, but not so much that it renders your story too difficult to hear? Oh, I thought I was going to enter it and, uh, end with too difficult to tell. That's Ooh. really, that's, let's, really let's, let's, that's do both. let's do I was both. Just let's like, talk about both. I started to yeah. craft my answer with that. So, um, so let's start with telling. Um, and mm -hmm. I think any producer or coach is going to say this. You need to decide if you're ready to tell it. Um, it is therapeutic, but not therapy. Um, it, the story kind of needs to be in some way resolved in your life, or at least you're finding some resolution because you're able to make meaning of it. It's hard mm -hmm. to figure out what your meaning is when you're deep in the emotions. So you need to feel good about a place to tell it. You also, and I'll say this on any subject, you own your story and you get to decide what you're comfortable in sharing. And sometimes, particularly when I work with refugees who have gone through extreme trauma, people say, I, I don't want to share the hardest moments. I'm like, in fact, there are ways to say, I can't share this with you, yes. but I can tell you the outcome that is just as powerful that people are like, holy cow, I'm not yes. going to also share my most personal moments. So that's on the telling side. On the listening side, again, this comes back to sharing your story in advance to a couple people, particularly if it's a sensitive story, because if you trust that person, they're going to say, you know what, I didn't actually need all of that, mm -hmm. or I do need a little bit more. And so then you're going back to how do I deliver it? Something that's hard for me when I'm watching a storyteller is I feel like they're putting on the emotion. 
Mm -hmm. and and you can tell because it's almost like the wording changes like they get to a point and they want to overemphasize and i think that actually if you just say you know this is hard or i, I remember feeling so lost in this time you can find a sentence or two that has the same impact yeah i totally agree and what what are your thoughts about um it being too emotional or too difficult for the audience to experience so again, I mean, if, forgive me if this is a bit of a repeat, that's why you want to check. Um, I think you can only be so responsible for what the audience is ready to hear. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, none of us are ever going to know what 150 people in a room are going to be having in their lives. Um, and in fact, sometimes being more emotional is the people that come up to you afterwards and say, mm -hmm. thank you. You know, mm -hmm. I tell some very difficult stories from my life about trauma personally. And when I did the play, it was partly about trauma in my life combined with refugees and and I remember I actually pitched it as a book first to a publisher and mm -hmm. they said, you can't put those subjects together. No one's going to want to read that. They're too heavy. Mm. And it was the director who said, actually, you should put them together because we can't segment our life out. Yeah. So again, you get to choose. Um, you can't protect everybody. Um, but if you're telling it enough, you're going to, you're going to get a sense of the audience. If it's dead silent, but not in that good way where they're hanging on their cliff, but they're just like, mm -hmm. this is awkward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You might shift it the second time. <laughs> Yeah, totally. I remember there was a storyteller who's also a photographer, um, who was once um, a teller on stories from the stage. And she, we almost always ask the storytellers what it is that they want the audience to take away from their story. And her answer was my favorite one ever. And she was like, I have no control over that. You know, like I, I don't, I, cre I create a thing and then the audience takes of it what they will. And I, I've like gotten away from a place where I'm trying to direct or determine what they take away. Um, and that was just like really helpful for me to hear as just like a really good reminder that you're gonna, well, you should the, put in the amount of emotion that makes sense for you. You I can't always control what people take from it. So Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I also think it's the difference between a speech and a story, right? Mm -hmm. You can do stories and speech. Speech, you're actually trying to convince people or something or convey something or having them walk away um, either to do an action or something. But in stories, you're just trying to connect. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So Anne has a question about st stage fright. And the question <laughs> is just how do you overcome it, um, especially in live shows? All right. Well, for me, if you know, if you were in stories on stage, you know that the last thing I tell you literally as you're about to walk up to the microphone is have fun. This is not football where competition and someone's ruling, rooting against you. Um, no one's going to judge you. Uh, people actually it's the biggest uh, fear for people is storytelling. So I just remind myself that 96% of that audience would never do what I'm doing. And that gives me a little bit of boost of confidence before I walk on. Um, and that always helps me. Um, I also often tell people, as Oprah says, if you're not nervous, you don't care. Mm -hmm. and so it actually should be that you're a little bit on edge and being like, how's this gonna go? And I guess the last thing I would say is another thing I always say to people is, you're not doing Shakespeare. If you forget to say to be or not to be, okay, in Shakespeare, <laughs> that would be bad. But in storytelling, nobody knows what your script is. And nobody yes. even knows if you change the order halfway through because you forgot something. And in fact, if you forget something, all you do is say, oh, I also wanted to tell you this thing, mm -hmm. right? And so that those are things that give me a little comfort. And ultimately, those kinds of things make you more human to an audience, <laughs> um, which is going to probably make them enjoy your story even more. Totally. So Doris um, has a question that, in my opinion, is a perfect question for you, Cheryl. <laughs> oh, no. Um, Doris says, I believe that everyone has a story, but often people don't believe it if, of themselves. How do you find the stories within other people? Oh, I do love that question. Um, we had a suitcase show last night, which is, again, what features refugees and immigrants. And I was touched that during that Q&A, um, somebody asked the storytellers, you know, why did you do this? And he said, I actually didn't know if I should do it. I didn't know if someone would care that my story mattered, even though he had been from Senegal, lived in France, spent 20 years trying to find belonging in the U.S. I think the first and foremost thing a coach should do in the beginning is not start coaching. It's mm -hmm. listening, validating, being interested, being curious. I spend so much of my coaching time not telling people what to do, but asking about their lives and trying to say, like, I never knew that. Like, thank you. Um, yeah. Or I want to know more about that. 
Now, that isn't to say that every storyteller I work with, and particularly the immigrant population I work with, knows what their story is. They've right. been approached because they are an immigrant, and we presume, as is true, that they have a story. But um, the same gentleman, actually, who made that comment said to me when we first met, here's the story I think I should tell. And I was like, yeah, that's really interesting. Can we just talk about your other stories? Because I had a sense that he had something else that would probably connect with audiences and perhaps teach people more. Mm -hmm. And I got that trick from my own play director. He was so humble. He would have me come in and all I did for three months was come in and talk at him for two hours, which may be why I talk a lot now. But he would just be like, tell me about your life. Tell me about your life. And then as politely as he could, he would say, this part's interesting, but that part's really interesting, which mm -hmm. is either another way of saying that was stupid. Don't share that. Or just like, <laughs> you got to make tough choices. And yeah. so I think that's how you start. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's a matter of like genuinely wanting to listen to people, genuinely being curious, as you said, and that's part of what helps pull out a great story. I also think for first time tellers, um, I think he's watching and I love talking about him. Uh, Chris Coe was uh, on, <laughs> I really hope he's watching actually now. <laughs> Chris Coe um, was a colleague of mine at the International Institute who I approached to tell, asked to do a suitcase story and he turned me down for two years and it became a joke. I wasn't actually forcing him to tell it. I just, every time I'd see him, I'm like, you sure you don't want to tell a story? And then I don't know what happened, but so, oh no, I know what happened. Another storyteller who did suitcase, who was also nervous is like, actually you should do it. Mm. And he did. And he fell in love with storytelling, ended up telling that story five times in a month, showing mm -hmm. up at some slams. And then I invited him to tell it on stories from the stage because it's such an important story about belonging. Yeah. Um, and so part of it is just trying and trusting and then seeing if you love it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Everyone wants to hear that they have something interesting and worth saying. And it's, it's a matter of reinforcing that. So Paula is asking a fantastic craft question, and that is, does a good story have to have a moral, or can it just be a narration of an experience? So I would say it doesn't have to have a moral, but there mm -hmm. does need to be a theme to it. It has to have something universal that we're all going to connect with, whether it's about fear or courage or just like joy and happiness. It doesn't, there is a sense, I think, in the storytelling world, we particularly get so many pitches about the most dramatic event in people's lives. Yes. And I mean, those are good, but we can't actually book every dramatic moment. We need the silly. I mean, Kemp Harris, season one, told a well, it is a little dramatic. Someone jumps in his car and his whole, it, who has been shot. Okay, that's dramatic. But actually, that's not what the story is about. The story was about he was a guy who's always late. And he's like, if I had not been late, this guy wouldn't have jumped in my car. So mm -hmm. it, it has to have something that we're going to walk away with. Because otherwise, it falls in the category of an anecdote. And anecdotes are fun, too. But mm -hmm. we're going to be like, oh, okay. Um, so, it, But I think sometimes people look like thinking they need the epic theme right so again another reason to tell someone else's story and see like what what were you interested in that yeah yeah i think ultimately it needs to be about something you know like something to hold on to yeah now that said i will say what i say in my intro classes every time i i talk fast you can imagine so i try to share a lot of wisdom um but i say there are two things that if you do not take away from this class i will be disappointed the first is please never walk up on stage and say today's my story is about I, it Yes. Chris. Also, please never walk off stage by saying, so my story was about, or the moral yeah. of the story was. Um, because if you told a good story, neither need to exist. Yeah, trust your audience. Trust mm -hmm. the audience. Yeah. All right. So Jacqueline is asking, when you, oh, I love this. When you submit a story, do you send the entire story or a snippet of it? Oh, please no. <laughs> I know I love stories. I want to hear them all. But um, in Stories from the Stage, last season, we got over 300 pitches. I don't have time to read 300 pitches. Um, I actually did a webinar for GBH about how to pitch. Um, so let me just give a couple tips. Yeah. Three or four sentences. But tell me the full arc. Like, where's the story starting? Where is it ending? And then what is the story about? And you can tell the what the story is about in one, one sentence. My story is about reconnecting with my mother and the importance of love. Mm -hmm. um, please do not do what so many people do. And I know it's sweet, but they tell me two thirds of the story and they say, contact me for the ending. Yep. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't, I don't have time. I'm, I, even if it was the best ending ever. So you're going to write uh, a couple sentences. If we're interested, Anna or I are going to reach out and say, now we want to hear a recording and a recording, not a text, because again, mm -hmm. we want to hear how you tell. 
Now, there are so many wonderful storytelling organizations in this country. You, got, you do have the Moth, the Risk, the Sound Bites, the one I had the privilege to be on. Yeah. Yeah. And they all have a little bit of a different um, pitch process. So you can just usually go to their website, see what they're looking for. Some people immediately ask for that audio. So it really depends, but that's yeah. how we work. Totally, totally. I think the biggest thing is like, don't do the like coming soon kind of thing. <laughs> like, the, yeah. like yeah, yeah. if you contact me, you'll find out, you know, it's well, and, like, and we, like don't, we don't know to contact you unless, unless the story's real good, you know? And it's a combination, yeah. right? You, some people send me just what happened in the story. And some people just say, I have a story about the epic thing that happened in my life. I yes. got to hear both because I can't imagine what the other is. Yeah. So we have a question from Dr. Lloyd, um, who's wondering, could you speak on how you frame your story for preparation? I'm not exactly sure what that means, but let's talk about how do you yeah. frame a story? How, how do you figure out like what fits and what's on the outside? Yeah. So maybe he's asking for me, like I said, I do my transitions, right? Yeah. And so if I'm doing a seven minute story and I guess I, for new people that should know, usually slams or five minute stories, mm -hmm. six on the outside, uh, a story from the stage or a mid story is going to be six, seven, eight minutes. Long form mm -hmm. is usually 12, um, unless you're doing a one woman show. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's, that's where you want to be looking at. So in a six to seven minute stories from the stage piece, I have about six, six, six transitions and that forces mm -hmm. me immediately to think, okay, what do I have to use to grab their attention? That's going to be about yeah. a minute and a half. How am I going to land the story in the last minute? And then, okay, I only got three more. And that doesn't mean three or four more action transitions. Right. It might mean two to three actions. Here's what's happening. All right, now this is happening. But then like a moment of like reflection, who am I? How am I feeling about this at the time? Or what am I worried about? What do I think is going to happen next? And then mm -hmm. we get to the action again. Um, and so that's one way to frame it. Yeah, I like to think of it as, I mean, this will be a long form metaphor, but I like to think of it as like, if I took you grocery shopping and I told you that we were going to make a meal, and as we walk through the grocery store, I'm putting the ingredients right. of that meal into the cart. By the time we get to the checkout, you should have some idea of what that meal is going to be, right? Unless I put a bunch of like erroneous ingredients in because I was getting distracted and I was like, oh, bacon, I love bacon. And I just put it in, you know, when like I'm making you something that's not going to involve bacon at all, right? Like I think a good story is like you intentionally put in the ingredients that are necessary for this recipe. In our lives though, there's always bacon. There's always pistachio ice cream. There's always potato chips. There's always other things. And like not everything needs to go in the story. I also think another thing that I think particularly first time tellers fall in the trap of is not knowing if your story can be told in six minutes. There are just some mm -hmm. stories that can't, right? Yeah. Um, and so if you have not timed it, even just casually, and you've pitched it to any of the shows I'm involved in, if it's 30 minutes, um, I, again, I don't have time to listen to 30 minutes, but that might mean it's not going to be in six minute yeah. story. It's probably one part of that 30 minute piece that you can right. work on and focus on. And so that's another way to start. Um, yeah. You might have a one woman show brewing if you've got a 30 minute. I was going to say, there's no way I would have done that story in six minutes. I mean, literally no way, but I do tell stories from the one woman show. I do. Right. Uh, and that's, exactly. but I, but I have to change what my focus of my piece is. Exactly. All right. So Jazz would like to know, at what point do you start to think about body language when you're telling your story, if you're practicing it in your car seated? <laughs> I was just going to say, I, know, I was like, all right, all right, Jazz, I get out of my car at that point. Um, <laughs> although I guess I don't with my hands. So, and, and right now with virtual storytelling, I don't need to worry about below my weight. Right? Um, first of all, this is storytelling, not performance again, right? You mm -hmm. should talk like you. You're not going to suddenly either gesture dramatically in a way that is not comfortable and looks very uncomfortable for you to even do. Um, but you do need to like be relaxed in your body. Um, and so again, you're going to know yourself. You're going to know how you usually talk. You should try even talking about something else and notice if you do move a lot. Um, and then sort of get into a rhythm with that. Yeah. Um, I also will make a very specific, and I made this mistake at the opening show of Suitcase. 
and I tell everybody else not to do it. I don't know what I was thinking. Do not wear, as a woman, be really careful with heels, um, particularly tall heels, because if you get a little nervous on stage, it can be quite obvious because your knees are sort of like trying to find their planting. So I usually wear flats or I wear a, maybe a one inch heel, but I was shaking like a leaf and I even knew that story and loved it. I was just excited to tell it. Yeah, so just, yeah. So. Yeah, totally. I'm not, I'm generally, when I talk, I use my hands. I don't move a lot though. And so oh, yeah. that's kind of how I, I can be. And sometimes it looks a little like too stoic, but it is also just like genuine to who I am. I'm not a very like boisterous person. So. Well, also as storytelling, a lot of people are disappointed when they show up and say, can I take the mic off the stand? Um, you cannot. Um, and I, very few producers will ever let you do that for just partly technically for all of us. We need to get reasons, the best sound. Yeah. But also there's something again, really grounding about seeing somebody just telling us a story. And Absolutely. so it's, it actually is an advantage to you, even though at first it might not feel like one. Absolutely. Well, we're gonna go into a break. Before we do quickly, we have a question from Freddie who wants to know if someone missed a show from you, like the show that you had recently, um, with, uh, I think just last night, how can they find that? Um, how can they find your work? No, oh, thank you for asking that. So Suitcase Stories, you can go to suitcasestories.org. The show last night will be up in like 24 hours. Nice. Um, we release some, but not all the stories. We sort of roll them out so you can keep revisiting. Um, and Suitcase Stories has a lot of shows. Um, for <laughs> Telenact um, and World Channel, I would just go directly for stories from the stage to worldchannel.org um, forward slash stories or GBH. There's lots of ways to get to that. And awesome. then on a personal note, you can go to my website, CherylHamilton.com. I know that the producers are going to put all these links in the chat, so find them. Um, but yeah, it's uh, again, and then Monday night um, on Club Passine. So if you're interested in that. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to bring in my colleague, Jamie, who has a quick message for us. Jamie. Hi there, Teresa. And uh, hello, audience at home. Uh, thanks so much for spending some time with us this afternoon while we are talking to our expert, Cheryl Hamilton, about the art of storytelling. Viewers and listeners turn to GBH for many reasons, whether it's to learn how to tell a good story or to simply be entertained for a while. If you feel GBH is worth listening to, worth watching and worth supporting, then we hope you'll decide to make a donation. Today, when you donate $90 all at once, or choose to give $7.50 each month as one of our GBH sustainers, we would be so pleased to send you a Stories from the Stage sweatshirt, which you can see pictured behind me as a thank you gift. It is so warm and cozy and it will match everything in your wardrobe. And for a $60 donation or $5 a month, we will send you a Stories from the Stage faux leather journal. It's the perfect place for aspiring writers and storytellers to jot down your thoughts and maybe future story ideas. So please visit wgbh.org slash support events to make a donation in any amount, or you can click that link you see in your chat box, which will bring you directly to our donation page. Every dollar our donors give enables GBH to continue to produce great virtual events like this one year round on a wide range of topics from the art of storytelling to understanding how the electoral college works. <laughs> if you believe in the power of good stories, then please support GBH. And uh, now I will throw it back to Teresa and Cheryl. Jamie, thank you so much. And I mean, anyone who tunes into Stories from the Stage regularly probably knows how much I love my Stories from the Stage sweatshirt. Um, <laughs> I mention it all the time. I just the other day was going out for a walk and I couldn't find my sweatshirt and I was really annoyed. I like searched all over my house. I think it's just because it's in the laundry finally. Um, but I was, I was like, where's my sweatshirt? It's my favorite thing to wear. I was just going to embarrass my husband too. All of us are stuck at home. We're wearing the same outfits over and over. He's been wearing the GBH shirt for a couple of days and I've been doing the stories from the stage too. So love them. Love them. That sweatshirt is just so cozy and it's a zip up. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So back to some of the Q&A. And this is a great question to sort of start us off in the second half. Um, Anne is asking, what are the elements you need to include to make your story compelling? Right. So um, there's really three, if you really narrow it down. I mean, there's probably like 20, but these are the three mm -hmm. that have to exist. So number one, there has to be some sort of conflict or problem that is driving your story. 
Now, that can be an external conflict, like someone's chasing you with a bear, which we actually had a bear story on yeah. stories from yeah. the stage. You know, and there's like, again, it still needs meaning, um, but you know, that's a big problem. Um, and so we're gonna keep in suspense. The other type of story is a story about the conflict inside of you. Maybe your self-doubt as an individual, or maybe your bias towards someone else that you're trying to work out. Um, and ideally, there's a little bit of both usually in a story. So in that bear story, and forgive me, I'm, I think Suzanne, is it Suzanne's story? Um, we, in that story- oh, Martha told a story about a bear too. Oh, Martha, thank you. Yes, yeah. there's, there's just so many good tellers. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we've had over 200. Um, yeah. In that story, it's as much about a bear attacking her mom and the family in a tent as it is about what she thought of her mom and what I thought about a strong woman and her father and her wrestling with the thoughts of a family. And so that's, that's kind of the magic. So first mm -hmm. of all, you need something that keeps us in suspense that we're going to be like, what is going to happen? Secondly, we need to know you as a storyteller. We need to connect with you as an individual, your hopes, your fears, your motivation, your background. Like we want to know about you. And I really say to people all the time, we want to know about your strengths and your weaknesses, right? None of us are perfect. And in fact, I hate people that present themselves as perfect on stage. I'm like, just, but I also- I Not also, believable. Exactly. And I'm also struggling with people who are overly self-deprecating. Now I'm known mm -hmm. as being a self-deprecating storyteller and I've actually had to work on being like, oh, but in this area I'm okay, right? <laughs> I don't know if it's my Irish background or <laughs> just generally, but, um, but you want to be a well-rounded individual on stage. And then the third thing we've already touched on, it needs to have a purpose. The story needs some theme that is universal that we're going to connect with. Everything else is like gravy on top, the scene, the setting, the dialogue. Um, those are great, but if you don't start from that place, you're going to struggle to have a full compelling piece. Mm -hmm. So the tips are, theme, who are you and yeah. why do I care? Yep. Have a conflict and be about something. Exactly. Perfectly stated. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Those are really good tips. It's almost like you teach this, Cheryl. Really good Sometimes. tips. Sometimes. <laughs> it's almost like you're an expert. Awesome. Sometimes. All right. Yeah, so are you. So, <laughs> Charlie is asking, um, do you have any tips for gauging audience feedback and connection when you're telling the story online? Oh God. Yeah. I really, a tough I, one. I want to feel for everybody who's joining storytelling through zoom world. Um, I have to say, I, I really did give a shout out last night. We had six storytellers telling really intimate stories about how COVID-19 has impacted their lives from six countries mm -hmm. and five had never told stories before and they had to record them in advance. And they, so then you, you kind of intellect, intuitively know you could mess up and record again. It, yeah. it, and it, it was harder for them than anybody walking on stage for 850 people live, in my opinion. Because when you're on stage, you know you got to finish the story. It's not like you're going to stop halfway, although if you do, because you can, but it um, you'll get through it. Um, so that's, that's number one. The second thing is I, like Monday night, I have to tell a story. I try to picture a couple of people that I want to hear my story. Sometimes it's my husband, sometimes it's my mother, sometimes it's just a friend who I know would be like nodding and laughing at me. <laughs> so I, I try to remember that there are people on the other side of this. I mean, even right now, right? Like, we're just like, I trust you're out there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's number one. And I'll go and I lean into my favorite parts. Mm -hmm. So if it's fun, I try to have fun with that part. If it's serious, um, particularly when I tell stories about refugees, I remember that I'm honoring somebody who yeah. I would like to people to care as much about as I finally, you know, got to connect with. So that's some place. Yeah, totally. I'd also say, I mean, just from a purely tech standpoint, frequently um, at this point, I've found that shows that are happening online, um, the participants, the storytellers are backstage, like we're in a separate room and we can see each other. That's so, true. so you can see some audience members, you know, it's, it's the other people who are in the show with you, but you can see them. And, and as part of being a storyteller is like, it's, it's a literary community, you know, and like you want to demonstrate good citizenship. And so when you're in just the backstage audience, you keep your camera on and you respond for the person who's telling because they're going to do the same for you. Actually, and that's, that's super actually, helpful. That actually reminds me, Teresa, that's actually a, another thing that I, I didn't appreciate when we first started because of chats and features like this, um, in a show you get claps and you get nods, but now we're getting direct comments like, oh my God, I love the that chat. Part. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, last night we had a woman from Iran named Maida and she had never told a story. She was one of the people that said, are they going to care? And I was like, oh my goodness, of course. But then she got overwhelming love from her colleagues at Boston Medical Center, from people mm -hmm. in the new immigrant program that I said, you should 
say something to them at this point because it was so much love and she just wrote simply in the chat thank you i'm blushing backstage yeah. so and that's that always happens at stories from the stage people walk in and they you know immediately beeline to the teller intermission is like thank yes. you yes always yeah but the zoom chat is amazing it's great it's great all right so i want to tell you that you have the right to say no to this <laughs> um but the top voted question right now is if you cheryl will give us a small story it could be an excerpt <laughs> from your 90 90 minute show or just any other story like can you give us like a little one oh, minute Lord. something something Oh, sure. This is where I shouldn't have said that I never craft. I should tell, right? <laughs> uh, all right. Well, a story I've been just having fun telling lately. Um, I don't know if there's a clock. Um, someone in the producers has to say stop at some point. Um, a story I've been telling a lot lately is how um, I was uh, I was dating a guy once who was, uh, told me one night at dinner that um, that women shouldn't ride motorcycles. He had signed up for a motorcycle class. He was like, this is going to be great. And I said, oh, my God, I love that idea. Can I come? And he's like, you? Well. Uh, I thought on behalf of all women everywhere, I should definitely take this class, of course. So two days later, I'm sitting in the front row like I used to be in school because I'm a goody two shoes. And I'm like writing on the notes down because it's a three day class and it's amazing. And on the first day of class, you take a written part and then there's two days on a bike. And then if you pass, you get a license like and you never leave a parking lot. Like that's insane to me. Um, so anyway, I did really well on the first day. And then on the second day, I show up with 16 men in me. So now I really have to represent women. And everybody else gets on their bike and they take off. And I'm sitting on my bike and the instructor comes over and says, what's happening? I said, I don't know how to turn it on. And he's like, you've never been on a motorcycle? I said, no, this is a motorcycle class. He's like, <laughs> oh Lord. I ran, over the, I ran over the instructor. I dropped the bike twice. I ran over every cone during the slalom part. But by the end of the day, he pulls me over and says, I don't think you should come back tomorrow. Oh. But what he doesn't know is that I used to be a roller derby girl. I am like tough. I am going to show up. And also, again, on behalf of all women, if I don't show up, then maybe my boyfriend and other men will think women shouldn't drive motorcycles. So he said, well, here's the deal. Go home. Stop thinking about it. Like, just just try to trust that it's going to be in your gut. I went home and all I did was think about it right the whole time. Like, I have to get this right. Um, but the next day when I came back and I got back on that bicycle, I sat there for a second and I thought, I'm a really good cyclist. Now it's not the same skill in cycling. You do turn and lean, but in motorcycle, you really got to lean the other way. But I got on the bike and I took off and it felt like everything I love about motorcycling, the wind in my hair, the like toughness, you know? And um, I got second in the class. I beat all those other men, except even my boyfriend I beat. Um, <laughs> but as I got my license in my hand, the instructor stopped me again. He says, wow, amazing please practice a lot more before you leave a parking lot. <laughs> now, I don't usually tell people in this story that I have never left a parking lot since, but I do tell people I have a motorcycle license. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Cheryl Hamilton. <laughs> Your stories are always a delight. All right, so we have just 10 minutes left. I'm gonna come at you with some rapid fire questions. So the right, first one crap. is, can you tell us about opportunities and spaces for people to tell stories about war and your experiences with veterans telling their stories? So, uh, so I don't exclusively have, con I mean, I, I have connections that I've heard. I don't know right off the bat, but I'm sure if you Google, there are storytelling for different themes, but I will mm -hmm. say two things. Obviously in the suitcase story world, we actually look for those because we know that um, people in the military are in the places people are fleeing as refugees. So I'm always curious about those. So if you know somebody with those stories, connect them with me. But the other thing is now, I'm gonna sound like a hypocrite for a second. <laughs> I actually like shows that are not always explicitly on one topic mm -hmm. because in fact, you should be trying to reach audiences that haven't heard these stories. This is why Stories from the Stage makes a deliberate effort to make sure we have military stories and stories about childhood, stories about adoption, I mean, anything. Um, and that's actually why I've tried very hard to have a lot of diversity on the show. Anna and I spent a lot of time deliberately going to find storytellers. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's what I would say. But um, but if you find one, please write me because I it's another place for us to find talent. Awesome. All right, next question. How do you know where to begin um, so that you get the audience's attention? Um, if you watch the episode Holiday Horror, I think from season one with Matthew Dix, there's a part of the interview, because in our show, Teresa and Wes always interview the storytellers. He says the hardest thing for him, and this is a guy who has won 
I don't know now, 60 slams and he's written yeah. several books on storytelling. Again, Matthew Dix, he says the hardest thing for him is beginnings and he will spend years on a beginning. But I'll say to a first time teller, um, if you have to like just practice something different, start in the action. Um, so many first time tellers fall into the trap of like, so my story is gonna be about, or, mm -hmm. and if you mm -hmm. just start, not only do you save a ton of time, but I'm immediately curious, like, where is this story about being on a roller coaster going downhill going? Is it a story about how your whole life is going downhill? Is it about the first time that you got over your fear of roller coasters? I'm going to be curious. Yeah, totally. So starting in the action often works and media res, as they say. Um, all right. Um, in this kind of storytelling, does the story always have to be about yourself or can it be about a family member or a friend or someone else? who had some kind of phenomenal experience. No, it's your story. Now that's not to say you can't talk about people in your life. In fact, there's no story that's probably not gonna have people in your life um, in it, but you are telling your story. You can't imagine what someone else was thinking, even if they told you, because plenty of us in life tell people what we're say saying, but it's not what we're thinking. So you're telling yeah. your story. And this was a challenge for me in a refugee story, right? I really wanted to tell other people's stories. But I often was saying in by opening my play, I'm sitting on the floor with a woman who's afraid that people are trying to break down her door and hurt her. And I go over to sit with her on the floor because I had something happen to me that I know how it feels just to have someone sit there. But mm -hmm. what I say in that whole scene, because there's nothing else happening than sitting on a floor for several hours, <laughs> is I say what I think she might be thinking of me the whole time and all my insecurities and how much I don't know about her. And I end with her in the end of the show, but I end with mm -hmm. her still not knowing if in fact that was a memory PTSD of her past or if someone actually was trying to break down her door. And yeah. so no, you're telling your story. Yeah, because ultimately the only story that you're the expert on is your own, right? Exactly. All right, um, any tips for songwriters who want to tell a three to four minute story in a song? Yes, um, so, oh, in a song. Um, oh, wait, tips for songwriters who want to tell a story in a three to four minute song, yes. Well, I think the principles still apply, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. something that's going to keep us on a journey, uh, something that has a meaning. I mean, a three to four minute story is pretty close to a five minute slam. Um, mm -hmm. We actually had two of my favorite stories. This is one reason being a producer is very cool. You can write <laughs> the people that you've been in love with as singers forever. So I wrote Jeff Folkalt and Melissa Farrick, and I was honored they both said yes. They both said it was really hard though, because once yes. they had to put down their instruments, there was a vulnerability. They hadn't, they didn't have their blanket for lack of a word, but you should watch that episode. It's, um, Oh, on the road, a road trip um, season. I two think there are two different games. episodes. Yeah, it was the same recording night. Yeah. So oh, yeah, maybe World Channel. But um, but they but Jeff Folkalt, my favorite singer, um, he actually took his song and transposed it into a story. But if you listen mm. to his song, it is the story. So again, it's the same principle, something that's keeping us going, something that has some connection. We're going to get to know you as a teller. And then there's some point to it. And I love his point. I'm going to repeat it here if you don't mind. His story ends and it's a story about how he went to a show in Iowa and six people showed up because of a miscommunication of marketing. And he's like, oh God, it's like I feel bad for the audience. They feel bad for me. But he said at the end of the piece, and it's the same with storytelling because this is going to happen with virtual shows. You know what? Like if it's not enough to do it for six people, it's not enough to do it. Like you should yes. love your craft. And I love it too. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes people show up to my show. Actually, it happened to me in my play. Uh, also a marketing problem. I had four people in the front row and I was like, do I do a 90 minute show for four people? And I did. And it was one of the most rewarding experiences because a father had come and the story includes sexual assault and other traumas. He walked up to me and said, I brought my 10 year old son because I thought he should hear about refugees and hear about women's experiences. I'm so glad I came. So you'll Absolutely. never know. Absolutely. All right. Another quick question. Someone, um, Terry is in a writer's group and finds that there's <clears throat> members of his group who have amazing and wonderful stories, um, but sometimes they come off a little dry or confused. So what are your tips for how to make a story read or sound less dry and more engaging? This is perfect. I'll answer the telling part and Teresa, you're teaching writing. So I'm going to pass it back to you. Um, on the teaching side, uh, we do on the stories from the stage as well as suitcases, as well as everywhere, we do a lot of what we call page to stage, helping writers become storytellers. And they say that it actually helps their writing because when you have to stand up in front of an audience and tell, you immediately get feedback. Whereas with a book or a novel, you're waiting until it's published. You're not in their bedrooms when they're reading it. And so that's a quick way to figure out, is this working? 
but Teresa, you teach, uh, you teach writing now as you're just an amazing writer, storyteller. Tell me what you would share. I think it's the same thing. I mean, I think the number one thing that grabs people is action and emotion. So starting in the middle of the action and being yourself up front on the page right away is, is usually what grabs folks. Yeah. All right, last question Ooh. is, um, this question will be hard to answer quickly. So I'm gonna go to the next one. Um, <laughs> do you often have several stories in your head at one time? And how do you organize those thoughts in order to um, extract cohesive stories from them? Well, sure, we live every day and we have a new story in our life every day. And, um, and so sure, but I do tell us first time storytellers, particularly if they're trying to get out to a lot of events, have four or five stories in your toolbox, have the dramatic one for a serious show, have the funny one, because honestly, it's sometimes hard to get funny stories. People again, <laughs> tip to the dramatic. So we're always looking for humor have the story that's appropriate for MLK day or for mother's month or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I do. Um, and as a producer right now, I, I'm, I actually haven't got to tell a lot, but I'm excited too. So I've got a couple that I'm thinking about, but sure, you should always have four, you know, you're working on. Um, yeah. And I don't, I don't think of them as collective pieces. I think of them as independent on their own work. So I'm attacking each on its own. Yeah. And I also, and it, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll just say the last thing is that I don't, I don't know. You could be telling a story for 20 years, um, uh, like Teresa and I have, or at least 10. Um, every story is a first time. Yeah. And some of the most professional storytellers, <laughs> you know, that you can, you can have a bad night. <laughs> and that's yeah. okay too. It's humbling and good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And having a backup story, if you're going to a slam and you're just putting your name in the hat, having a, a backup story is good because if someone just told a story that was super similar to yours and you don't want to kind of get lost in the shuffle, then you have your fallback. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So we still have a few more questions um, in the q and I'm so sorry that we're not going to be able to get to everybody's questions, um, but we're just about at time and I'm going to bring Jamie back up for a few more words. Thank you, Teresa. Hello again, everybody. Just one more reminder that contributions from viewers and listeners like you support GBH's ongoing efforts to develop new content to keep you informed and make your day a little brighter. You, yes, you all at home can help ensure GBH is able to tell more stories on air, online, and during events like Ask the Expert. Today, if you donate $90 all at once, we would be so pleased to send you a Stories from the Stage sweatshirt. It's comfy, cozy, warm. We all talked about it. We love to wear it when we're not hosting events. Um, and it will match everything in your wardrobe. <laughs> color. And if you spill, it won't show. So again, $90 or um, monthly installments of $7.50, we will send you that Stories from the Stage sweatshirt. And for $60 a year, that's $5 a month. We also have a lovely full leather Stories from the Stage journal, which is a great place to write down your ideas and maybe ideas for future stories. So just click the link you see in our chat box right now. That link will bring you directly to our donation landing page. That's wgbh.org slash support events. As we navigate this ever changing reality right now, all donations from WGBH viewers, listeners, and virtual event guests helps keep us going and going strong. Now more than ever, your commitment to GBH makes a difference. Thanks for joining us and we hope you'll decide to support GBH. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, yes, everyone's support is just so, so meaningful and it, it, keeps, it keeps the reminder and provides the funding so that we can continue to share stories and to have events like this. I mean, to have Cheryl Hamilton just like talk about the craft uh, for an hour is like really dope. <laughs> so it's so, fun, Teresa, and I don't get to see you in person these days. So <laughs> I know, I know. Also, like it's just fun for me that we get to hang out for an hour. Um, yeah, this is this has been great. I again want to apologize to folks who had questions in the chat that we didn't get to. Um, but you know, continue to come to shows. Maybe if you go to Cheryl's show um, on Monday, there might be a little Q and A in that, and you can toss your questions in there as well. Um, to find out, go ahead. 
you can also write me. Um, it's an easy uh, to remember. You, it's mail at CherylHamilton.com, M-A-I-L, and my name. So I don't mind. I'll there you go. There you go. And you can find out more about Cheryl and just connect with all of the many things that she's up to by visiting CherylHamilton.com. I again want to thank everybody for being here. Um, you can find those links and the email in the chat. Once again, thanks for being here. And Cheryl, more than anything, thank you for joining. Thanks so much for this, all of it. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for all right, here. everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs>